Well, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. And um, Matthew chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 1. And uh, I'm going to be talking tonight about, uh, about fruit, uh, about bearing fruit, about looking for fruit. And I mean, the Bible talks a lot about fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. You've got basically Jesus, we'll talk about this scripture or go through this scripture in just a little bit where Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit, talking about more or less someone's behavior, not so much what they say. And I think, I think, church, I think we're living in a day and age to where talk is cheap, right? Because every ter- everywhere you turn, every corner you turn, every news channel you turn, all you hear is lies, lies, lies. Have y'all, do, y'all ever, do y'all ever just watch some of the stuff that is coming out of even the White House and the news channels? And you're like, man, everybody knows they're lying, and so even if they were to speak the truth, we wouldn't believe them anyway because it's like, you know, I've heard somebody say one time, they said, you know how I know they're lying? Because their mouth's open. It's like, it's, <laughs> you get to where people, they don't particularly, I must use the word, they don't particularly care as much what you say. They're looking more for what you do. And I don't think it's any different with the church. I think that we can hold signs up that says you're welcome here, but our faces may give a different message. I think that we can have greeters holding a sign up that says, I'm glad you're here, but when they ask how are you doing, you just kind of snub them off. Come on, look, I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> Carol, Carol, you better behave tonight. I'm going to tell you right, right now, if if. If I'm leading a church, I want somebody that's going to be the real deal. Hey, even if you're a little rough around the edges, just as long as you're real, I'm good with that. I can take rough, but just as long as it's real. Because I think that fake is what is leading people astray, and it's what's keeping a lot of people away from church simply because there's a lot of Christians that could be sued for false advertisement. I, it bothers me, y'all, uh, y'all, this might just be ha- like half rant, half revelation tonight, okay? It bothers me when people claim to be full of the Spirit, but they mean as snakes. You ask any person in the service industry how hard it is to wait tables when church folk get out. Full of the Spirit, but no patience, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Come from a spirit-filled church, but zero long-suffering when it takes them a little bit longer to get their sweet tea than they ought. Come on. Claim to speak in tongues and prophesy, but can't get a hold on the self-control when something doesn't go our way. Come on, this, look, this fruit of the spirit thing, y'all, it's easy to claim, but it's real easy to mess up, too. I'm going to refer back to when I was young, and she doesn't really do it too much anymore, but mom, uh, well, she does decorate, but mom, would, she'll decorate our, look, y'all, our house growing up, it changed themes, and I'm talking everything changed, things on the wall, things on the table, the tablecloths, the place mess, every, look, whatever season it is, everything changed, and so this one particular time, it was getting, it was about fall season, and she has, how many of y'all know what the big, remember the big cornucopias that everybody used to put on their table? And some people don't even know what that word means now. But the big cornucopia, the big wicker basket looking cornucopia thing, and it was stuffed with all this fruit. And so one day I come in from playing outside, or I come in from somewhere, and I see this big luscious apple and I go, and I'm like, oh, an apple. So, you know, I get it. I, I polish it off. I don't even bother washing it. I go to take a bite and almost lost my front teeth. It was fake. It was, and I, I think maybe just the Holy Spirit reminded me of that whole scenario today 
just for this message because, you see, here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want people in the, on, on the outside of these church walls. I don't want people who do not know Jesus yet seeing this big, ornate display filled with fruit, and all of a sudden they go to taste it, and they break their teeth on it because it's fake. God help us that we don't put something out and advertise what we don't actually have. I don't, I don't ever want fake fruit in my house. Well, I don't want my kids breaking their teeth on it. Maybe I'm still scarred from my childhood, being disappointed in that apple. But y'all, y'all see where I'm going with that, right? And, and so I want to I talk about fruit. I want to talk about identifying it. I want to talk about producing it. I want to talk about correctly identifying it. And we're going to go through all those things. But maybe a weird scripture to start this off with. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, it says, Now it came to pass... When Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison, so John's in prison. When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Continuing on in verse 4, Jesus' answer back to John the Baptist is this. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And look at what Jesus finishes it with. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. Now, I want to paint this whole picture. In John chapter 1, you'll read that John is on the scene and he's baptizing people And Jesus comes onto the scene, and if you're familiar with the passage, John the Baptist looks over and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We see Jesus confirmed and affirmed by his Father in the most grand fashion, and John basically points and and lowers himself and says, This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the Son of God. How many of you know John the Baptist spent his entire adult life in the wilderness not caring what anybody thought, just doing what the Spirit of God let him do or led him to do uh, under the anointing of the Spirit of Elijah is what the Bible says. And so John the Baptist emphatically, without any doubt whatsoever, he points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Sounds He's pretty convinced that this is the Son of God, the Messiah. Are we right? Now we find John in prison and he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one, or should I look for another? In other words, now John is having some doubt. And I've preached this message before, but I just wanted to use this as an insert about how easy it is to mislabel fruit in our lives depending on the circumstance in which we see it. Look at the the contrast of these declarations that John the Baptist makes. This is the Son of God, and on this hand, are you really the Son of God? This is John the Baptist we're talking about now, y'all, who Jesus, right after this, says about John the Baptist that there's never been anyone else born of a woman greater than this man. Think about that statement coming from the Messiah. So we see John the Baptist in a turmoil, he's in a, he's in a, a hard spot and he's doubting what he has put his faith in is there anybody that can just raise your hand and say hey i've been there before because of the circumstances i'm doubting what i've put my faith in we may even feel like god sent us somewhere sent us to someone sent us to do something and then we get there the circumstances look slightly different than we imagined it had and we start asking the question god is this you or should i be looking to do something else anybody else been there you had you're trying to find yourself or is this god's will or not and sometimes the see the enemy he's slick he knows just when to send the right person with the wrong message, or he knows when to jump on your shoulder and start throwing those lies. It's always when your faith is hanging in the balance and you're beginning to ask these questions 
And, and the, the devil knows when to, he knows when to come back. And a lot of times he'll always attack you at the last place he was successful. So he'll, he'll come in during these times of transition and unsettling. And when these questions are in your mind, can I tell you something? Just because you begin to ask God, God, is this you? That doesn't mean you're in sin. It just simply means that you're human and you find yourself just like John the Baptist did. You're in a hard spot thinking, okay, this, doesn't, this didn't play out like I thought it would. God, are you in this? Think about that statement. Not only was Jesus the Messiah, the one that he was prophesied of, not only was he the one that John the Baptist pointed to, they were cousins. It's not like he's not familiar with this man who's just walked on the scene. And John the Baptist, I believe, was very familiar with miracles, with the Spirit of God, with the power of God, with the anointing of God. Here's what I think was the, one of the hang-ups. Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. I think that John the Baptist was not so much hanging up on what Jesus was doing, but how he was doing it. Because we have to remember that even though John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness that the Son of God was coming, John the Baptist was still raised up under Pharisaical law. John the Baptist was still a product of the law at that time. Y'all follow me? And so for him too, he's reaching a place to where his paradigm of thinking is going about to shift too. Now, he knows what the Spirit of God has told him, but here he is now. It's looking different because Jesus, have you ever paid, have you ever paid attention? I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine at work the other day, and we were talking about how many places in the Scripture that it actually talks about Jesus being in the church. I want y'all, I want y'all to ponder that for a second. How many times do you see Jesus actually in the synagogue in the Bible? Not many at all. Just a few. He, the first time we see it is when he's about 12 years old, when he gets lost from his parents. We see it when he reads the scrolls of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We see it again when he comes in and flips the tables over and runs all the money changers out. Y'all, Jesus didn't hang out in the church. I wonder why. Because he might be going to the synagogue thinking, man, these people claim to know my dad, but they ain't nothing like him. Oh. Y'all want to hear, I feel like I need to lighten this mood up. I don't know, it just got heavy in here for a second. Y'all all right? There was a, <laughs> I heard this story one time of this man decided to visit church so he goes to this church and he walks in and all he had was some flip-flops some shorts and a t-shirt he walks in and that pastor pointed his finger he said son don't you ever come in this church like that again you go out and you go home and you pray and ask god what you should wear in his house so the young man says this is a joke y'all i hear some people going "Ooh, okay <laughs> So the young man goes home, he prays about it. Next Sunday he comes back, he's still got his flip-flops, his shorts, and his T-shirt on. Pastor goes up to him, he says, I thought I told you to go and ask God what he would wear in this house. He said, I did, but he said he ain't ever been here before, so he didn't really know either. (laughs) That's one of my favorites. (laughs) But you know, Jesus didn't hang out in the church a whole lot. And so when he comes and starts saying the things that he's saying, I, 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 look, I'm not saying they were right, they were wrong. But sometimes I can empathize with all the people who have been following this certain train of thought for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden you got a man coming along saying something that is so counterculture. It's so controversial. It, I mean, literally, they would tear their robes when he would say things. It begs the question of how many times does God continue to try to do new things in our life, but we are offended because not of what he's doing, but the way he's doing it. John the Baptist was absolutely inside the will of God when he was sitting in that prison. We know this because the word of God. There are times that I think, church, that we can be sitting in the, in the will of God, but we're questioning whether it's the will of God. We're questioning whether it's God's heart simply because it's not comfortable. 
And when you start talking about fruit, I don't think the fact that John, Bab the, John the Baptist asked that question, I don't think he was having a problem identifying that the dead were being raised, that blind eyes were being opened, that the deaf were here and the lame were walking, people were getting healed. I don't think he had a problem with the fruit. I think he had a problem of where he was and how this whole thing was going down. Which I, I, I said that whole story to say this. It shows how quickly our circumstances can change our perspective and even alter what we call our faith and our revelation. Now, maybe some of y'all have never questioned your faith. Maybe some of y'all, no matter how hard life has gotten, you just said, Lord, I trust you 100%. I'm good to go. I'm not with you in that. I'm just going to be honest. There's been times where I've looked up and said, God, are you, is this you? Are you in this? Sometimes I've had nothing to follow except my peace. I can't tell you, you talking about the fruits of the Spirit, y'all, I can't tell you how important it is to be familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, to know the fruits of the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, because the fruits of the Spirit will guide you through this life. I'm going to give y'all, I'm going to give y'all just a very practical, there was really nothing wrong, it was just a scenario uh, 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 about a month, no, in July, so uh, just a little while back, I lost a paycheck. And so I had to go to the office, and I told him, I said, hey, I lost the paycheck. We need to, I need to see if I can get another check cut and void the old one. Well, long story short, they wrote out another check because we were all getting ready to leave on trip. So we wrote out another paycheck. I went and cashed that. Well, several weeks later, just last week, I'm sitting in Dad's office, and I, I, have, I was sitting there, and I had my legs crossed, and I just happened to look down in the seat, and there was a paycheck falling down in between that seat, and I pulled it out, and sure enough, it was mine. And so I just wanted to make sure. I said, Mom, I said, uh, hey, make sure that this is the one that, you know, I, I missed. Let me try to make this long story short. Mom said, I can't find it. I can't see where we voided a check. I can't see where we did this. And finally, she said, if, if I can't see where you voided, so just go cash it. If, if, it, if you can't see where you voided, you can't, if you think you skipped one, y'all, I'm going to try to sum this up. I literally went to the bank. Now this, this, is, this is nothing criminally or immoral. It's just a, it was just a, a lost check and a mistake. But I went to the bank. And as small as that thing is, small as this situation is, I'm sitting in the drive-thru and I pull up to it. I did not have a green light in my spirit to cash that check. I didn't. I was like, something just don't feel right. I'm not doing it. I drive around the bank. I come back to the office. I'm like, I'm still trying to look for it. I can't find it. I find where I missed a week, but I'm like, you know what? So I call Lauren. I was like, hey, can you pull our bank records? And so sure enough, I went, we went through them week by week by week by week by week and realized that, okay, that was an extra check. The, the whole reason I said that is because of this. As small as that scenario may seem, I, every time that I would even think about bringing that check and depositing, I would get an uneasy unfit, just not a lack of peace in my spirit. And you say, well, Daryl, you really think that was God? Yes, I do. Absolutely, I do. Because it's the same familiar spirit that there's times to where I'll be riding down the road or I'll be going somewhere or I'll, I'll be thinking about doing something or going somewhere. And if I get that uneasy, chat, I just won't go. Listen, I had a huge fishing trip one time playing with a good buddy of mine, and he called me the night before, and he said, hey, dude, I, I don't know how to explain this, but I'm not going in the morning. And I said, okay, was everything all right? Call me crazy, bro. I just don't feel like I need to go. He said, I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me not to go. I said, well, don't argue with it. Don't go. He's like, well, if something changes, I'll let you know. I was like, if something changes, you ain't getting in my boat. <laughs> If you Jonah, I ain't, you don't get my boat. <laughs> like, I ain't going through no storm because you ain't supposed to be there. And so we laughed about it. But, y'all, I think that sometimes if we're paying attention to the fruit of the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit, I think that sometimes God will help us get to a good outcome in our life if we're looking for it. Okay, so let me try to, let me try to roll on with this. Um, three things that I just wrote down, three, three takeaways of how I believe that looking at the fruit of the Spirit looking uh, for the fruit of our lives can help us in our everyday life. Three things. The first thing is how we look at our situation. 
how we look at our own situation, judging fruit, okay? So real quick, Matthew chapter 7, I want to read that, Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, and then we'll talk about this point. Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. This is Jesus' words, verse 16. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, even though every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. When it comes to ministry, by their fruits, you will know them. That's one thing that I so appreciate about this church is that this church has a very deep heritage of longevity, of integrity, of morals and character. And this church has been a, a church that has bared fruit, borne fruit in Walker and in the community and in the world for decades. This church has, has sowed seeds and it is a church that bears fruit and fruit that remains. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that and it sounds like I'm bragging. I kind of am. I'm more bragging on God and his faithfulness. But I, I just want to tell you something that in, at any time in life, when you're looking to come alongside or partner with something, someone, for any reason, whether it's church, whether it's a relationship, whether it's business, look at not, don't look, listen to me, don't look at the gifts. Look at the fruit of their lives. Look at the character. Because there's a lot of people with a lot of gifts, but they have no character. Look for the fruit in something. I, I just, several years ago, I'm not, I'm, I'm by no means, I, I'm, I don't find myself to be just an absolute super discerner. Um, I'm not very prophetic in, in, in my gifts. But I was introduced to this, this young pastor several years ago. And all I can say, y'all, is from the first time that I met him, there was an uneasy check in my spirit. Everybody around me was singing his praises. Everybody. And no matter how many times he tried, no matter how many times that we were around each other, there just was never a kindred spirit. There was never a linking together. There was, I just never felt the green light to get in a covenant with this guy, and I didn't know why. I couldn't place my finger on it. My wife and I had conversations about it. She confirmed, even in conversations, like something's off. And y'all, it, it just took a few years. Something was off. And I watched some of my friends that bit it hook, line, and sinker that they're all surprised. And at that point, I was so thankful that I've been raised by Wes Courtney, who in the spirit was raised by W.S. McMaster, that taught you to pray about something and look at the fruit and look at the outcome of the fruit in the lives. Now, and I don't know if that means anything to y'all, but I am of the belief that you don't just go joining yourself to anything and anybody in this life, especially nowadays. Look at the fruit. Don't attach some, listen, there's a lot of slick, if y'all ever bought a car, you know there's a lot of slick talking people who care nothing about your well-being or your finances. Am I right? No offense if there's any car salesman in here. No offense whatsoever. What I'm just simply trying to say is that some people have a gift of gab. Some people have giftings, but there's, you got to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Are they one in the Spirit? Okay, so looking at fruit. Can, it can really determine, it can really help, and really change how we look at our own situations. Here's, here's when it comes to look at the fruit in our own life. Looking at the fruit in our own life, sometimes we can't even inspect our own fruit. Because sometimes we're, we're bad judges of character, even for ourselves. Now, you don't have to amen this. You can oh my or oh me or, or woo wee, whatever you want to do. But I love it when people say, oh, God knows my heart. Exactly. And that's why he said that the heart above all is deceitfully wicked. I trust my heart. I don't trust my heart. I trust my spirit, but I don't trust my heart. So when it comes to even judging fruit in our own life, can I tell you something that you have to, I, I believe you have, I'm going to say you have to have, because I don't believe that you need to go through life without a covering, and I'm going to use this term, I don't think you need to go through life without having somebody that's a fruit inspector in your life. 
In other words, looking at you and saying, hey, man, what's up with this fruit you're bearing here? Hey, hey, you, you're not producing anymore. You want to know what that look? Can I, can I tell you what that looks like on a, on, a, on a daily, weekly basis? This morning, Dad and I walked into Josh's office, and we, we walked in, and I said, hey, Josh, I was like, look, Daddy, Dad asked him first. He said, uh, I noticed I haven't seen this person, this person at church lately. What's, what's, what's going on with them? That's not judgment. That's looking at the outcome of their life, noticing that they hadn't been in church and spending time around all their other godly friends. In other words, there's some fruit missing that was there before, and so we're just taking notice of that. Hey, maybe check up on them, see what's going on, make sure there's nothing going on. But if you don't have anybody above you, you don't have anybody around you that you can be accountable to, then you might be sitting there thinking, oh, man, my fruit's good. I saw a picture one time. It was a picture of an apple. And from the front, it looked completely whole. It looked nice. But then all of a sudden, they had a mirror behind it, and the whole back of the apple had worms in it. And it was all eat out and rotten and decaying. How many of y'all know that people will show you a facade? They'll show you what they want you to see, but deep down, they might be rotting away and dying. You can't even trust yourself sometimes looking in the mirror. You need something that looks deeper inside of you. Number one, that's the Word of God. The Word of God will inspect your fruit. Number two, you need a pastor. You need a covering. You need an accountability partner to be able to call you on things. That's why I, I get a kick out of people when they, they say, hey, will you be my accountability? You don't want that. You don't want that. I will ask you uncomfortable questions. I'll make, I'll make it weird for you, too. I'll do it at the most inopportune times. You're walking in church. Hey, what you looked at this week? What? What? <laughs> I came to worship. I came to keep you real. I mean, I know we need that person. When it comes to inspecting our own fruit, most of the time, the thing that's going to keep us lined up is the word of God. And, and can I tell you something? You can't lie to yourself. You can, but it ain't going to really work. The fruits of the Spirit. One of, my, one of my favorites that I like to talk about is gentleness, uh, two of my favorites, and self-control. I'm amazed at how many Christians will take those two and place them to the side and justify the reasons why they don't have it. Can I tell you something? And I'm not just talking to the men. The men, this is, this is a lot of times this predominantly affects men. But this is men, women, this is everybody. If you fly off the, t the handle and lose your temper and you go in a rage and curse and fit, you don't have control of yourself. You don't. If you cannot control what goes on, do you not think that there's times that people say things to me that I feel my pulse in my neck come up? Is anybody, ever, anybody familiar with the Wim Hof breathing technique, Brad? I know you are. Anybody familiar with that? It's a breathing technique that gets everything back down. It teaches you how to get your heart rate back down and use certain breathing techniques to get you back in a calm, cognitive way of thinking. There are sometimes that people will say things and do things that I have to start breathing in a specific way. So if I'm ever around you and I'm breathing funny, Either you done it or somebody's done it. <laughs> I'm just joking, y'all. But really, <laughs> I'm kind of him, but kind of not. But on a serious note, print out the fruit of the Spirit and just go down that list and grade yourself on each one of them. Oh, man. How am I on self control? Oh. How am I on gentleness? How am I on kindness? Love, peace, patience. How, how am I on these? Grade yourself. Be honest about it because you're going to know whether you really, and look, whatever ones you don't like, ask the Holy Spirit to begin to work on you. Now, I hope yours is not patience because if you score low on patience and you ask God to help you with that, Oh, buddy, I feel like I just feel for you. That's, that's all I just feel for you. Look, you better learn how to breathe. Dad and I took Maddox fishing. He was out of school last Friday, and so we took him fishing. Let me tell you something. 
Three people in a 17-foot boat will teach you patience, especially when one of them's nine. And you just missed a fish that probably weighed better, better than four or four and a half pounds, and you're trying to go back at it, and you go to rear back, and so does your son at the same time, and your reel gets that big. <laughs> All I could think of was that I was that little knot-headed boy one time messing up dad's reels. And look, I had to get myself, like, it's okay, bud. I had to get it, get it back in control. And then Maddox asked me this question. Dad, when you were a little boy like me, how many of Papa's rods and reels did you mess up? And Dad's in the front of the boat, and he just bust out laughing. I said, a whole lot of them, buddy. A whole lot of them, man. But, you know, there's some times where real-life circumstances will begin to test these, these spirits. They'll be te- begin to test the fruits of the Spirit. I'm just, I'm just being real with y'all. If we can get a good grip on exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, y'all, we, you won't even have to worry about just going out and handing out gospel tracts. Your life will be a living witness if you would just bear the fruit of the Spirit. I was having conversations during Missions Weekend with Javier Mendoza, and when they were in New York City, they moved there for just a little bit of time for a strategic reason, and they were there, and he said that he and his wife, Danielle, would just go and love on people and smile, and he said, I could not believe how many people would walk up to me and just say, hey, man, what is it with you? What, what, what's going on with you? New York City, like Manhattan area, New York City. And he said that people were so confused as to why somebody was just smiling. Why is somebody just happy? And look, inevitably they would ask the question, how? And he said, oh my goodness, man, it was so easy to witness. He said, there's a pastor in New York, and he told me his name. His name was Michael. I can't remember his last name. He said, he does not have a big church building nor a huge congregation. He said, but he's ministering in downtown New York and in Central Park. And Javi told me this. He said, dude, they are casting out demons. He said, they are, they, they, he said, they are seeing people saved. He said, they are seeing lives changed. He said, they're seeing people set free. And I'm like, wow, because people are looking for the real deal so much that when they see it, y'all, they'll pay a high price to go get it. They'll travel to go get it. They will go find the real thing. And if we would just get full of the Holy Ghost and start living a life that bears fruit of the Spirit, my goodness, I'm telling you, you would be like little beacons of light walking around in the darkness. Everywhere you go, it's going to light up. People are going to ask you, why do you smile so much? When somebody asks you how you're so happy or why you smile, y'all, if you don't jump on that opportunity, you got problems. If you don't take that opportunity to say, man, let me tell you why. I, every, I love when people will ask me, like, man, what, why are you always smiling? I'm like, because most of the time I'm always happy. How? And I told this one lady this time, I said, look, because... My life is not controlled by outside circumstances. I said, I'm controlled by inner circumstances. And every morning I wake up and I get that inner circumstance right. And I said, to put it plainly, I said, you can't have peace with other people if you don't have peace with yourself. You can't have peace with yourself unless you got peace with God. So the first thing I do every day is I make peace with God. Then I have peace in myself. Then I can have peace to give to other people. It's that simple. Fruit of the Spirit, it's not a difficult thing, but my goodness, is it a life-changing concept. Man. Number two, it'll change the way that we look at others. It'll change the way that we look at others. When we start to really look for the fruit of the Spirit and the real things, how many of you know that everything that sparkles and glitters is not gold? I... (laughs) There's a whole bunch of more crude, crass ways of putting that statement, but I'll let it ride at that. Everybody that smiles is not genuine. Everybody that says that they're with you or they're for you, they're not always with you or for you. But that'll be proven not by what they say, but what they do. and How they do it. Question is, who are you when nobody's looking? But when it comes to looking at the fruit in other people's lives, again, the same way that we do it in our own life, we need to be bumping it up against the word of God. Judging it against the word of God. Not who's got the, the coolest things, or who's got, who's got 
the best, who's, who's the best looking, who, no, who has the, fr- the fruit of the Spirit? Now, listen, this is what I really want to talk about on this subject, about when we really get this concept of the fruit of the Spirit, it'll change the way we look at others. Um, I, I, I was wondering this morning, this was kind of, sometimes it's so funny how all these things come together. I, I'm typically, I like reading in the New Testament, and uh, like yesterday and, and today, I read the whole book of Galatians and Ephesians, but I was, um, this morning I woke up, and I was, I was like, I went to the Old Testament. I went to 2 Samuel chapter 6, the story of David when the Ark of the Covenant is coming back in. And I want to read that in verse 20 through 23, and this is, we're going to talk about judging fruits of others with this passage. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 20 and 23. Now, to, to, to really speed up the whole process, we're talking about when the ark is coming back into the city of David. It has been in Obed-Edom's house for, uh, for a little while, and Obed-Edom's house is blessed because the presence of God was there. But David is now coming back to where it should be. He's bringing it to the temple that they've constructed for it. And Uzzah has, Uzzah, Uzzah, however you say his name, he has already stretched out his hand, touched the ark. God struck him. He died. So at that point, David basically gets angry, and he asks God, how in the world are we supposed to get this presence back where it's supposed to go? So they go six steps. They stop. They worship. They sacrifice. They go six steps. They stop. They worship. They sacrifice. You can preach a whole message in this, whole, this passage. But when they start getting close, I mean, you know how the story goes. David begins to dance. Here's the mighty king sits on the throne, and he begins to dance so emphatically. He begins to dance so passionately because the presence of God is coming. The, a man after God's own heart. David might have had some mess-ups, but one thing he was was a lover of God. He was always repentant, and he was a person after God's heart. And so Michael, David's wife, observes him out of the window coming down the road, and he has done dance clean out of his wardrobe. And so in verse 20, we pick up, this is what Michael says, Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of his maidservants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint, me to, to, uh, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will become even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Now, Michael the daughter of Saul, David's wife. Surely she has to know that David's a worshiper. He's a king, yeah, he's a warrior, but he's a worshiper. She's married to him. But the way that he's worshiping is obviously embarrassing to her because she goes and takes issue and she makes this sarcastic, cynical statement. Oh, how glorious was it that the king was disrobing himself in front of all the servants and all the people. And she's basically saying, you embarrassed me. She's judging the fruit of David's life in this moment. Now I want you to look at what the very last scripture of this passage says, verse 23, therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. When I read that, y'all, I sat back in my seat. I said, oh my. We better be so careful when we put a label on somebody's fruit and label it something other than what it really is. And you say, what are you talking about? She didn't bear any more fruit until she died. How many of y'all know what a child was called in the Bible? The fruit of the womb. A wife was known to be blessed by how many children she could have. Now, whether it was God that closed her womb up or whether it was David 
who looked at her and knew that she was not with him, and so he refused to sleep with her. I don't know. But either one, whichever one, her looking at his worship and judging his fruit and saying, that's not the Spirit of God, caused her to not bear any more fruit or have a productive life. You better be very careful when somebody is, they got some, God's doing something in your life. Better be careful that you don't point the finger and say, that's not God. Because I don't want to. I don't want to look at somebody and say that's not God. Now, if it doesn't line up with the word, it ain't God. But just because somebody does something that I'm not comfortable in doing doesn't mean that it ain't God. There's a whole lot of things that I guarantee you that I do that some of y'all would never, never get into. And guess what? That's okay. I'm not you, you not me. But we need to be careful when we're talking about bearing fruit. You know, I'm, I never forget that, that, that time that these people told me I was fake because I was happy all the time. They were looking at the fruit of the Spirit in my life saying that that was fake, that you, I was being deceptive. I don't know this, but they could, they could have been reaping something back on themselves for their harsh words towards me. And, and you know what? All I know is that I'm still around those people. And, and the, the few people that have said that to me, they're still as unhappy as they've ever been. I didn't lose no sleep over. I'm not saying that to be cocky or arrogant. I'm just, because I'm not faking. I might be rough, but <laughs> I'm going to do my best to be real. I don't, you can ask my wife. I, I don't really know how to play poker. People have asked me to play before. I'm like, I don't really know. I'll teach you. I don't really care. Like, but even if I did, I'm telling you right now, I would be a terrible poker player because I do not have a poker face. I am not good. Like, you can ask her if I'm if, if I got feelings going on, you are reading it. Like it's 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 published front page. Boom. Daryl ain't happy. Nope, he ain't happy. It's very easy to see it. But when it comes to looking at the fruit in others' lives, we need to be careful that we're judging this thing right. On both sides of the fence, just because somebody looks like they're, looks like they're producing good fruit doesn't mean that they are. And maybe because they don't dress or they don't talk or they don't walk, maybe because they don't look like they would produce fruit, they might be huge producers I know a man who was a multimillionaire that never wore anything but Wrangler blue jeans and a pocket t-shirt. That's all he would wear. Multimillionaire. Decided one day that he was just going to buy a Dodge Viper. He just wanted a Dodge Viper. So he goes to Salisbury Dodge City. They had one. And he goes, walks in there, and he tells him, he says, uh, I want to buy that car. And this little young guy, he goes, well, sir, we're going to need to run your credit. No, I don't need credit. I'm going to buy that car. Well, we're going to have to run your credit, and we'll have to do this. And he said, you're not listening to me. I want to buy that car. I'm either going to pay you cash for it, or I'm going to write a check for it. Well, sir, first we need to get your credit going. Is it? He said, thank you, have a nice day. He drove just a little bit on the other side of the river, went and paid cash for one, and drove it back by the dealership and showed this young man. He said, don't ever judge a book by the cover. And walked out. A man who walks up in a dirty pocket t-shirt, you wouldn't think he's a multimillionaire. But let me tell you something. Everybody who's wearing shiny shoes and a, and a fake Rolex, they ain't loaded either. I, I long ago, I quit being enamored by people's gifts and flashiness. Show me somebody, Brother Larry, show me somebody who's been following God for years when it hadn't been comfortable. Show me somebody who still knows how to hit their knees and pray. Show me somebody who's still bold enough to go up in the marketplace and witness to somebody, no matter where they're at. Show me somebody that will look at the person who doesn't love themselves and say, hey, God loves you. I love you. Show me somebody that will put a coat on somebody. They'll feed somebody. They'll put food on their table. They'll take care of them. Don't show me somebody that's got a huge resume. Show me somebody that bears some fruit. Third thing, 
when we get a grasp on the, on the fruit of the Spirit, it'll really change the way we look at what God is doing in our life. One of, I think one of probably one of the most difficult things about growth as far as talking about bearing fruit or even like gardens or something like that is the concept of pruning. But if you've ever raised a garden or you've ever done anything in agriculture, how, and you tell me how important it is to make sure that you are pruning, that you're getting the weeds and you're getting the things that are drawing the life out of the, the, the soil and away from the plants, the places it needs to be. You know, a person who, who has a green thumb, a horticulturist or something like that, they know exactly where to snip. They know what to take away. They know just how much to, you know, they, they know how to make stuff grow. Y'all, y'all with me? Maybe you're that person. I'm not that great at it. But, you know, a lot of times I used to, I used to wonder when they would cut these trees back. They need to be cut back now. But uh, these trees along the driveway, they would cut them things back, and they would cut it down to a stump. I'm like, man, what in the world? That's ugly as sin. What are they doing? A few months later, these big old blooms coming out again. Oh, that's what they're doing. Can I tell you something? That sometimes to bear fruit, sometimes God's got to prune some old stuff away. Sometimes to bear fruit, he's got to get some stuff that is inhibiting that fruit from being produced. Sometimes God has to weed our garden a little bit. Do y'all, do y'all know what happens to a garden if you just leave it to, your, to itself? Come on, y'all help me out. Grows up in weeds. It becomes chaotic again, right? Us left to ourselves We will have weeds growing everywhere. We'll be chaotic. We won't be, listen, before long, here's the thing. For a little while, you'll still have some tomatoes. You'll still have some some cucumbers. You'll still have some fruit here, some vegetables here, and you got a few weeds growing here. But you don't check those weeds and you let them things keep going or you get a little insect or some worms or or, or something like that. You let that go unchecked, and before long, you ain't going to have nothing to eat and nobody, nobody else is either. Why? Because you didn't keep track of the fruit. And so whether we like it or not, sometimes God will come through and he'll start to uproot stuff in your life. He'll start to snip stuff in your life. Sometimes he cuts people out of your life. Can I tell you all that? That there's some people that may be keeping you from producing what God has called you to bear. People don't like to hear that. But it's the truth. God started, listen, I'm telling you, I went through one season of pruning Felt like I wasn't nothing but a stalk. Like, I ain't nothing but like a little bulb right here, and that's it. Like, he done cut everything off. Like, God, I ain't got nothing. Ain't got no friends around me. <laughs> like, like, me and my wife, we're just standing here. But, you know, it doesn't take long to where you see, even in the pruning, he's doing it because he wants you to bear fruit. Because he needs somebody to ask the question, man, how do you have so much fruit in your life? How do you do do that? Yeah, it's trials and tribulations. Man, how, you know, how do you stay calm and how 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 you stay cool in this situation? Some of it's just wisdom, experience, life. But I'm gonna tell you right now, y'all, If you make it a point every day to get up, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you to an overflowing. I'm telling you, if write out the fruits of the Spirit and look at them and say, man, where do I struggle? Why would you not want to be a more well-rounded Christian? Why would you not want to bear fruit? Why would you not want to be somebody that everybody else can look at and say, I don't know exactly what it is, but man, I want that. Some of the most beautiful phone calls and conversations that I've ever had has been through or from friends, old friends that I used to party with and that we ran, we, we run the nights with and that I stayed up days at a time with. Friends that, you know, did all kind of obscene things with. And then they see the fruit of a life. And they don't like where they're at. 
and they don't know how to get there, so they make that phone call. It's happened more than once, and it's the most beautiful conversation when an old party acquaintance calls and says, hey, man, I've been keeping up with you on Facebook. I've been, I'm, I listened to your sermons. Dude, I, how did you turn your life around? And I say, I didn't. It wasn't, make no mistake, it wasn't me. I might have made a decision. He turned me around. Let's just be real. Let's just be, let's just be fruitful, real Christians. Y'all, this is, this is just a, I feel like this is a basic message. I really do. But I believe that it could be so impacting and so powerful if we would just look at the fruits of those spirits and say, God, help me to produce each one of these. Now, look, like I said, wherever you struggle, don't be surprised. If that's where he sends you a little, well, I'm going to check you on this. Yeah. You know, you struggle with self-control. I can just, y'all, I can just about guarantee you somebody's going to do something stupid in front of me in traffic on the way home. I guarantee it. I just about guarantee it. Either that or I'll turn my sheriff's office radio on and somebody's going to be losing their mind and it's going to happen to be on the way home right by my house. That's happened too. One night I left here from speaking and I was just, I was like, God, it was a heavy message. I was like, God, strengthen me. I need you to, I need you to help me. And all of a sudden I was like, I wonder what's going on. I hit the radio and there's a head-on collision about a mile and a half up the road from me. I'm like, oh, my goodness. When we go, you know. As soon as I get there, and look, I was praying to be able to help people have peace. And as soon as I get there, I hear like, ah, just screaming. I'm like, oh, dear God, here we go. I got on the radio. I said, whatever unit is heading this way, you better step it up. <laughs> like, I don't know how much of this I can do. But it's crazy, y'all. I'm telling you, you start praying for God to work with you, work on you. You better get ready. But I'm telling you. Might be uncomfortable at times, but man, when we see the fruit of the Spirit begin to change people's lives, don't worry about what people say. It's the fruit that matters. Amen? Y'all stand with me. I want to pray for you. I don't know how time feels on y'all's side, but it goes by pretty quick from my my perspective. <laughs> I really pray that the Holy Spirit just begins to speak to us and to uh, to truly convict us about how we live our lives, about bearing fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I, I, would, I would encourage you to go study the fruits of the Spirit in the Bible. Go study the fruits. Like I said, write it down if you have to. Write it out. Pray about those things. Ask God to help you bear those fruits because I'm telling you, it'll change somebody's life. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for every single person that has come tonight. Lord, I thank you for the time that you've given us together in your word. I thank you, Lord, that we're not here by our own might. We're not here by our own power, but we're here because of your spirit, God. And I pray, Father, that tonight that you would let us be a church. Let us be individuals. Let us be families that bear the fruit of the spirit. Lord, I pray that it would be such abundant fruit, Father, that people would notice it from a long way off. God, I pray right now that you would cause us to live such a life that reflects you and your love and your goodness Lord, that it just makes people beg the question, what is so different? God, I pray that you would open doors of influence, open doors to spread the gospel, to speak love to someone, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone who needs to hear it. But Lord, I pray, Father, that we would not be fake, that we would be real, and that we would bear fruits of the Spirit, Father, to where it brings glory to your name, honor to your name, and points people to you, Jesus. I pray you seal this word by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Watch over and protect us, Lord, as we leave here until we come back together again. We love you and we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.